It is now time for oral questions. The member from Nipissing. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. My question this morning is for the Premier. I'd like to acknowledge a dubious anniversary today, uh, Premier, that no one outside of the Liberal Party is celebrating. Two years ago today, you, as campaign co-chair, put in place an expensive Liberal seat saver program. Of course, I'm talking about the cancellation of the Mississauga power plant. It's their anniversary today. Let's call it the crowning achievement in a career of Liberal self-interest. Well, I'll tell you, Speaker, who's not celebrating today. It's the Ontarians who've seen their taxes and their hydro rates skyrocket because they simply did not care what it cost to win those seats. We've learned, Premier, that you've spent $275 million to cancel the Mississauga power plant. Would you take this opportunity to tell Ontarians what it cost to cancel the Oakville power Question. plant? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Before I, I am going to answer the question, but before I do that, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank all of the uh, the women from the legislature who uh, attended the Habitat for Humanity build yesterday, yeah. uh, the women build, and I want to congratulate the member for Huron Bruce for winning the hammering contest. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> awesome. Mr. Speaker, yes, and she's in the leader's chair today. That you win a hammer contest, look what happens. There you go. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, I think it's important to recognize that the issue that the uh, the member opposite raises is one that we all agreed on. That every party in the legislature agreed, Mr. Speaker, that the siting of those gas plants was not what it should have been. So, in fact, Thursday is the two-year anniversary of the leader of the opposition's promise, Mr. Speaker, to move those uh, those gas plants. So we. We, we implemented the promise that all of the parties in the legislature had put in place, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. I know you don't want to talk about your cancellation of Mississauga, but we also know that you have uh, been given a draft copy of the Auditor General's findings on Oakville. Will you tell us what it costs to cancel the plant, or will you continue in a long line of Liberal operatives who have dodged, deleted, and destroyed documents? And while you're at it, would you please tell us when the overdue documents will be turned over? These are the ones that your uh, team was to turn over to us, our committee, last September 12th. Your energy minister, his deputy, the IESO and the OPA have all failed to turn over their documents on September 12th. Premier, your operatives are all risking contempt. You say one thing, but you do the other. Will you order those documents to be turned over to our committee today? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, um, I know that the government house leader may have something that he wants to uh, to say on this, but I will just say, first of all, we do not have a copy of the uh, the Auditor General's report, and so no matter how many times the uh, member opposite suggests that we do, we do not have a copy of it. And when we do, Mr. Speaker, um, obviously it will be uh, available. I do not have the draft report. I do not have the draft report. I do not have the report. I have seen neither. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, that. That's in answer to that part of the question. On the other issue, I just want to outline what we what has been provided. Um, 135,000 documents have been provided to uh, answer the questions that have been asked. 95 hours of testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Premier. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. So let's recap where we are. On this second anniversary of your cancelling the Mississauga gas plant, you've spent at least $585 million of Ontario taxpayer and ratepayer money, and we're not done yet. You won't tell us the cost of the Oakville cancellation, even though you already know it, and you won't turn over the documents that were due two weeks ago. Order. Furthermore, you won't expand the mandate of the Justice Committee to allow us to uh, talk about influencing the Speaker's office. Your buzzwords are not. I, uh, I caution the member and I ask again a reminder to all members we, would, we do not comment on an already ruled upon issue. Thank you. Reword that question. Premier, your buzzwords are not open and transparent, they're clam up and cover up. You're not fooling anyone, Premier. We want answers on Oakville. Excuse me, excuse me. The, uh, the, the member will withdraw. I withdraw, Speaker. We want answers on Oakville. We want an expanded mandate, and we want our documents now. Question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, 
I came into this office, Mr. Speaker. I said that we were Mr. going to open up the process and we were going to provide answers to the questions that were being asked and that we were going to provide the documentation. That is what we've done, Mr. Speaker. As I said, 135,000 documents have been provided, 95 hours of testimony, Mr. Speaker, 55 witnesses, and that goes on and counting. 32 motions, Mr. Speaker. There has been a lot of work done to determine exactly what the issues were surrounding the relocation of the gas plants. I asked for the Auditor General to look at both the Mississauga and the Oakville plants, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I, I thought that it was important that both plants be, uh, both situations be looked at. So that's why we are getting a report, Mr. Speaker, on the Oakville plant. We, we do not have that report yet, so I do not know the de Answer. deliberations or the conclusions of the Auditor General yet. Mr. Speaker, but our, our process in this has been to provide the answers to the questions that have been asked, Thank and that's you. what we've been doing. New question. The member from Renfrew and Nipissing. Thank you very much. My question is for the Premier. Premier, it's been two years since the McGuinty Wynn Liberals cancelled the Mississauga gas plant in the middle of the 2011 election, and nine years since the local community made the government aware of its opposition. It took months of obstruction from your House leader before a committee was finally able to look into the scandal, and since then, you've taken every opportunity to undermine its work. You've sworn repeatedly that all the documents have been turned over. But here we go again. Another deadline passed two weeks ago, and we're still waiting for 20,000 pages of documents. Premier, are you ready to admit that you really don't want the truth to come out and that you're hoping that if you stall this long enough, it'll just go away? Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the opposition just came off a policy weekend, and uh, there's a lot of bluster, criticism. Their job is to, uh, to oppose, but it's also their job to provide policies. They issued a white paper uh, a number of months ago uh, dealing with uh, privatizing Ontario power generation and the nuclear fleet. Well, what the, uh, what the Toronto Sun, that liberal newspaper, the Toronto Sun, had to say was that Hudak should keep in mind the last Tory government in Ontario that tried to do that with electricity generation promised it would lead to lower rates. Mr. Speaker, instead it led to the exact opposite. Rates skyrocketed amid rampant Tory patronage and the uh, As a reminder to everyone, when I stand, your mics get turned off and the time stops. And comments while I'm trying to speak are not helpful at all, including trying to shout down the member from trying to answer. And I would ask everyone to have that same dignity that everyone has deserved when asking a question and when answering a question. And I will remind you again, when the questions get put, I'm still hearing noise from the side that's putting the question. And when somebody's answering, I'm hearing heckling from the side that's putting the answer. It's not conducive to this place. Please finish. You have a wrap up. Thank you. Uh, so, the Liberal newspaper, the Toronto Sun, said instead it led to the exact opposite. Rates skyrocketed Answer. amid rampant Tory patronage, and the Conservatives, faced with rising public fury, abandoned the scheme, leaving a financial disaster in their wake. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you. Back to the Premier. Premier, sometimes you've got to put your money where your mouth is. It's not enough to say you want the committee to do its work. You also have to direct your Liberal operatives to stop, stop obstructing. This afternoon, after repeatedly refusing to testify in the lead-up to the by-elections, we will finally be hearing from the Minister of Energy's former issues manager, Mr. Ryan Dunn. When staff at the OPA withheld documents that should have been released, Mr. Dunn was named as having given the orders. When we ask witnesses who were responsible for the low-balled and inaccurate cost of cancelling the gas plants, again, Mr. Dunn's name was invoked. Premier, if a miracle does occur and Mr. Dunn remembers who in the Liberal Party ordered him to obstruct the work of the committee, will that person be fired today? Question. Thank you. Sure, Mr. Speaker, we appreciate the fact that they're going to continue to criticize. That's part of their job. Sure. It's also part of their job to be clear in their own policy. And, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the official opposition seems to change his mind daily oh. when it comes to win contracts. Oh. 
at the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, he said he would not rip up existing contracts. Oh. Yet just the other week at the international plowing match, he seemed to flip-flop and announce an end to wind. Oh. I don't know if this is a flip-flop or part of Mr. Hudak's hidden agenda. What does he mean? Is he going to cancel existing contracts? Yes or no? What's he doing? You guys have to be accountable for your policies. Please. Supplementary. Final supplementary. The minister certainly is an exp expert on wind because that's what we were getting from over there. Premier, by refusing to hold Liberal partisans ac to account for their actions, you're daring the public to hold you accountable for your inaction. Mr. Dunn has been named no less than, by no less than five other witnesses as being a key player in the Liberal Party strategy to withhold documents and obstruct the work of the committee. If he comes before committee this afternoon and claims not to know anything, and that sworn testimony by other witnesses has been false, you will be sending a strong message about your kind of leadership. Under a Kathleen Wynne government, Liberal partisans can destroy documents, ignore members' privilege, and mislead the public. And all they I'm, uh, I'm concerned with the, the way in which it's being used you can say something on the side that tries to and say the same thing, so I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. And I'm also going to ask the member to refrain from using personal names, as I will remind the government side members for using the refrain from using names. We always refer to members either by their title or by their writing. The member will finish his question, please. I withdraw. And, and all they get as they make their way out the door is a pat on the, the head to thank them for a job well done. Question. Before coming to Premier, before you became Premier, you stood for something more than that. Thank you. What? Thank you. What is Thank you. Order, please. Minister of Energy. Yes, again, Mr. Speaker, uh, they are really tremendous critics, and we hear them day in and day out. But they're coming off a policy conference, Mr. Speaker, and uh, they needed to clarify some things there, and they haven't done so. There is Biden. You know, the leader of the opposition came out with a new policy several weeks ago uh, to support uh, industrial energy rates in the province of Ontario. And he said he was going to fund that by cancelling renewable energy, remove that from the grid, Mr. Speaker. Well, we did some calculations, and the calculations show that the 4% of renewable energy that's in the grid, there's no way it can support any industrial program. Once again, their numbers just don't add up. You analyze their whole platform, None of their numbers will add up, Mr. Speaker. It's time they came clean on their policy. We know they're good critics. Now, they can't stand for anything that's clear, concise, or adds up, Mr. Speaker. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Last spring, New Democrats pushed hard to make life more affordable and provide relief for drivers facing the highest auto insurance rates in Canada. Is the Premier still committed to delivering results for drivers, Speaker? Thank you, Premier. Yes, Mr. Speaker, and I, uh, I've made that clear in, uh, in uh, a number of uh, instances when the leader of the third party has asked me that question. I've made it clear that uh, reducing auto rates was something that was very much on my radar, Mr. Speaker, before I came into this office. We've made a commitment to, uh, to reduce auto insurance premiums, Mr. Speaker. That's our target. We are working with the industry to get the costs out of, uh, out of the industry so that those, uh, those average costs of auto insurance premiums can go down. That's that's, that's our commitment, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, two years ago, Ontario's Auditor General noted that part of the formula used to set rates was badly out of date and ensured insurance companies a profit margin that was hard to justify. Now, the Liberal government promised a cut of 25 per cent to insurance companies' return on equity. Did that happen, Speaker? Uh -huh. Thank you, Premier. Minister of Finance, Mr. Speaker. 
So, Mr. Speaker, uh, the, the <clears throat> leader of the, uh, of the third party is talking about the ROE reduction uh, that was incorporated, uh, but it's not the measure that's going to make the difference here. Really, what makes a difference is us getting at the anti-task force recommendations on fraud. It's uh, working closely with a very competitive insurance industry in the province of Ontario, which I may say have now come forward initiating reductions uh, publicly on insurance rates. Both cooperators and CAA have uh, made reference to that. We have encouraged the public to shop at various other uh, uh, insurance providers who have now come forward with reductions. And the industry has noted that even prior to us coming forward with our, with our uh, policy and, and, and initiations to reduce rates, that they did yes, decline sir. by 0.4 percent, even prior to us making those calls. Thank Mr. you. Speaker. Well, Speaker, while the Minister of Finance loudly promised a major reduction in the House last spring, when the time came for action, the Liberals quietly backtracked in the dead of summer. The Liberal government promised to take a stand for drivers, and in the end, they didn't keep that promise. Does the Premier think that that's delivering results, Speaker? So, Mr. Speaker, um, we have been working on reducing auto insurance rates for a number of years. We are the ones that actually initiated the Anti-Task Fraud Task Force. We are the ones that introduced uh, legislation in 2004 to reduce insurance rates, which, by the way, neither party have been able to achieve during the time that they were in power. We will continue to do what's necessary and work with the opposition as well as all others in our, in our uh, province to get those rates down. And I'm pleased to say that the actions that we have taken are now proving to show results, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the leader of the third party. Back to the Premier, my question, Speaker. In hearings last week, New Democrats pressed for details on this issue, and government bureaucrats admitted that this broken promise would create a barrier to lowering rates and getting the 15 per cent reduction that the Liberals promised but drivers aren't seeing. Does the Premier agree? No, Mr. Speaker, I don't agree because we made a commitment in our budget that we would work with the sector to reduce auto insurance, and that is what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. As the Minister of Finance has said, we established the Anti Fraud Task Force. We're implementing the recommendations, Mr. Speaker. We need to get those costs out of the system in order for the average auto insurance rates to go down, Mr. Speaker. Rates are not increasing on average. In fact, on average, rates are going down, Mr. Speaker. That has already happened. Reductions for individual drivers will be We're different Hamilton, depending Stony on Creek, a number of factors, order. including their driving record, Mr. Speaker. So, the, and I think the, the member from members of the third order. party know, Mr. Speaker, that even the 15 per cent reduction is an average reduction across all the drivers in the province, Mr. Speaker. That reduction is spread across Answer. the province. So, we are working to make sure that we hit those targets, and 15 per cent reduction is the target that we're aiming for, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, drivers were promised relief, but it seems like when the government should be putting a plan into overdrive, they're shifting into reverse instead. Christine from Mississauga, she tells us this. I received, and I quote, I received my insurance renewal this summer, and it has not gone down. It has gone up by $60 per month. I've, take, I've had to take a second part-time job just to afford a car, and now, with this latest even higher increase, I really don't know, know how I will be able to keep my car." Unquote. Now, after backtracking on yet another commitment to drivers, what does the Premier have to say to people like Christine? Mr. Finance. Mr. Finance. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So let's be clear. Members within the NDP have actually written on this issue and cited the following. We, this is a quote, we cannot truthfully say they've broken a promise in reference to what we are doing here in the government. I've already stated very clearly that as a result of the initiatives that we've taken, rates have been going down. In fact, rates went down by 0.3 percent even prior to us making the call. While the member may want to talk about individual issues, 
We are talking about the industry average, and we are stating and noting that both cooperators and CAA have already made a pledge to bring it down. We are providing new licenses for medical clinics and fines already being levied, and we provided new powers to Fisco so that we can enforce and ensure that those savings are transferred to the public. And the public have means and, offer and ways to go to make those complaints official so that we can make certain that they're all being Thank protected. You. Speaker, I have no hesitation in standing in my place right now and saying the government broke their promise on reducing the return on equity that they said they would reduce for the profits of insurance companies. Drivers were promised that the government would take the tough steps needed to bring down rates. Instead, the Liberals did break that promise. Drivers were told the government would heed the advice of the auditor. Instead, the Liberals ignored that advice, Speaker. Drivers were promised that rates would go down. Instead, many drivers with clean records are seeing their rates climb drastically. Does the Premier think that this is delivering results? So, Mr. Speaker, achieving reduction in the premiums is giving results. Achieving re reductions in their claim costs is enabling those premiums to go down. And the member is making reference to ROE at a benchmark of 11 or 12 percent. The fact of the matter is those insurance companies are receiving much less at about 3 percent. So that's not the issue. And there is a hotline for the very for an individual who feels that they're being uh, discriminated against or caused to uh, receive harm. There's a hotline that they can call to ensure that they get the best value and the best results. But, Mr. Speaker, for the member opposite to suggest that we haven't maintained or kept to our promise, the, the, the facts are we are delivering on those results. We have initiated the changes. We provided more powers to fiscal, and we are acting on the very Thank initiatives you. to champion and protect consumers, Here. Mr. Speaker. New question, the member from Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, we know that your government is fond of having conversations when they suit you, but you ignore conversations when they don't. Here, for example, here. the House is well aware that your government didn't care about conversations when it came to citing power plants in communities that didn't want them in Oakville and Mississauga. But when it comes to email conversations between backroom political operatives about how to spin the power plant scandal and intimidate members of this legislature, there are conversations aplenty. When the Premier was called to Justice Committee earlier this year, she said she wanted to be open and accountable for all conversations. But now, in the position to act, she prefers to not have these conversations with the committee to find out about this intimidation. Question. This has been dragging on for months, Premier. Can you tell this House right now that you will expand the scope of the Justice Committee to, do, to investigate these kinds of intimidation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, I, I, we've addressed this several times in the House, and I, I think your ruling has been clear. But, Mr. Speaker, you know, I couldn't help but listen to uh, the opposition earlier talk about anniversaries. And today, actually, Mr. Speaker, is the anniversary of a press release put out by Jeff Yanisik, Saturday, September 24th. And this is what it says, Mr. Speaker. The only way to guarantee this power plant does not get built is to elect a Tim Hudak Ontario PC government. A Tim Hudak government will cancel this plan. And, Mr. Speaker, in a few days from now, we're going to have another anniversary of the famous YouTube video where we got to see the Leader of the Opposition stand up and say that if he was elected Premier, it would be the end of that plan, Mr. Speaker. It would be done, done, done. Mr. Speaker, why the Premier loves a good conversation, the government House Leader is a man of a few words. And I find it passing strange, Mr. Speaker, that the Premier ducks behind the hedges, she sends her House Leader out to take the fire. On September 18th, our, our House Leader called for unanimous consent to expand the scope of the Justice Committee, and the government House Leader said no. On September 19th, the member of Whitby Oshawa called for unanimous consent to have conversations about developmental services, and the government house leader said no. 
And just yesterday, the member from Timmins, James Bay, called for unanimous consent to expand the scope of the Justice Committee again, and the government House Leader said no. He sat there while we asked for conversations, surrounded by dozens of Liberals, and said no, no, no. no. The people of Kitchener Centre deserve better than a doctor no. Premier, will you look to your left? Walk eight feet over to your House Leader and have a conversation about accountability you. in your government. Yeah, hey. oh, 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 oh. Mr. Speaker, let's talk about. I will uh, look to each individual members now. I would ask also the government side not to do the same. Government House. Mr. Speaker, let's talk about accountability on the other side of the House here. April 16th, four opposition candidates invited to testify at the Justice Committee, including PC candidates the Jeff Yavis and Karen Churchill. They all declined. April 30th, Tim Rudak is asked to testify. He declines. Backup witnesses Yanisik and Churchill also declined. We then invite PC candidate Marianne DeMonte Whalen. She accepts and is scheduled to testify. Then, Mr. Speaker, surprisingly calls back a few hours later to cancel. May 2nd, Yanisik Church and DeMonte yes, Whalen are called to testify. Yanisik tells the clerk to stop calling, and the other two do not respond. May 7th, Tim Rudak is once again invited to testify. Thank you. Your question, the member from Trinity Spadina. My uh, question is to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Yesterday, we all had to endure the sight of uh, politicians from all three levels of government fighting to claim political credit for a subway extension in Scarborough. The people of Scarborough aren't interested in which rooster can crow the loudest. They just want good public transportation. I don't blame them for thinking that all three levels of government laid an egg on this issue, but Scarborough residents deserve results, not a freshly had transit plan every morning. Does the minister really think this is the best way to plan transit for the people of Scarborough? Minister of Transportation. Um, Mr. Speaker, next week, the Ministry of Transportation, the Ministry of Infrastructure, the Growth Secretariat, and Metrolinx will release some of the most detailed data and metrics on ridership impact, uh, job creation, uh, and evaluation of routes. The I-Corridor tools that have been developed by the ministry are arguably the best in North America. We, this government will let the evidence speak for itself on ridership, access, job creation, uh, affordability, uh, and impact. And I think once people see the evidence, it was interesting that when I read the TTC report, there wasn't even a ridership projection, Mr. Speaker. We're not a government that wants to build subways that are going to be running empty or, or the inappropriate technology. We'll get value for tax dollars and we'll choose the options that meet the needs. Mr. Speaker, this isn't about a politician. It isn't about a game. Thank you. It's about not waiting 40. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, uh, everybody's making announcements, but announcements alone will not get the shovel in the ground. To get this done, we will need sustained and steady leadership. When will the minister stop freelancing, stop the chaos, stop drawing lines and dots on a map, and focus on getting transit built for Scarborough? Mr. Speaker, um, I have one question. When will the member from Trinity Spadina's party read the map and realize it hasn't changed? And I've never pulled out a pencil or a crayon or changed a dot or an eye on a map. It's the same map. The member from Scarborough, uh, from Scarborough Guildwood all the way to Don Valley West will tell you that the line is the same. Other governments have changed lines and have not written checks. This government is, is, is committed to two things, not changing the lines on the map and writing checks. We are the only government investing in a significant way. $50 billion in the big move, 15 projects across the GTA. 
Mr. Speaker, 90% of that is funded by the government of Ontario, Answer. and has been the policy of the Liberal Party of this province. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member from Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. It's regarding Ontario's auto sector, which is a vital part of our economy, both across the province of Ontario and locally in my constituency of Oakville, where the Ford plant is located. I know the auto sector is an important part of the economy, a significant employer in the province of Ontario, and it's an integral part of Oakville's local economy. Speaker, it's important we continue to create and retain jobs across the province, and we need to ensure that we're supporting key sectors like the auto industry. These are very competitive times globally. Ontario has proven that it can compete on the global stage, and we remain one of the top auto producers in all of North America. With last week's announcement in my riding, many of my constituents are asking what this announcement actually means for the local economy. Will the minister please update the House on what our government's recent announcement at the Ford plant Question. means in Ontario and to the auto sector in this province as a whole? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. And thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thanks to the member from Oakville as well for this great question. He joined the Premier and I last week for this announcement. It's an exciting time, Mr. Speaker, for Ford Canada. As the member mentioned, our government, as did the federal government, Mr. Speaker, made a $70.9 million investment to support Ford's overall investment of more than $700 million in this province. And this investment will secure 2,300 high-quality jobs at the Oakville plant, as well as the numerous and many thousands of spin-off jobs in the supply chain uh, leading into that production and help Ford, quite frankly, build one of Ford's nine global platforms in Oakville. This will position the facility to be among one of the top-tiered platforms for Ford in the entire world. It's great news for our auto sector as Ontario produces right now more vehicles Answer. than any other jurisdiction in North America, and in fact, we're on track for a record sales year this year. Thank you. Yeah. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for that update. Auto workers in Oakville and across the province should continue to see the strong commitment our government has and continues to make in the auto sector, but there's still com some concerns from my constituents about overall growth in the auto sector. We know Ontario as a province has fared far better than many other jurisdictions in North America. Our economy is back on track, having recovered all of the jobs that were lost during the global economic downturn and much more. But despite investments like this, having a good job to wake up to and to go to every day is what's going to keep this province strong in the long run. So, Speaker, through you to the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment, what is our government doing to support the continued growth by helping to create good, meaningful jobs in Ontario's auto sector. Question. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. And I want to commend, first of all, the hardworking employees at the Ford plant and in the auto sector right across this province, Mr. Speaker. And it's important. Unifor was there as well. This is a great example of a partnership between both levels of government, the private sector, and our labour uh, friends. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the sector is responding very, very well. In fact, since the bottom of the recession, we've added more than 13,000 new jobs directly wow. to the auto Auto sector in this province. And of course, in, uh, in St. Catharines recently, General Motors announced that they were adding 50 new full time employees at the St. Catharines plant. These are full time uh, positions, as I mentioned, at the powertrain facility there, and they are being filled under the terms of the local agreement with their Unifor uh, partners. There are also a number of other investments through the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund, Armo Tool, North American Stamping Group, and Linamar, who produce the parts and materials that are sold through these uh, auto manufacturers. Factories yes, that are keeping our province, Mr. Speaker, strong and thriving. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, member for Lakeshore, uh, uh, Lakeshore. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Uh, before I ask the question, though, Premier, I would like to just clarify one matter. The mistake with the gas plants wasn't taking them down; it was building them in the first place, and only your government did it. Well, Premier, here we are on another beautiful day. You've had all night to think about it. Perhaps you've even been able to have a conversation with uh, the minister from Winnipeg. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Stop the clock. Uh, one time is one too many. One time is one too many. The next time I hear it, I'm going to move on to the next question. So the member will withdraw and then use the proper title. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I will withdraw that. 
At any rate, what I would like to know is whether you're now in a position to join with the federal government, the City of Toronto, the TTC, the residents of Scarborough, Tim Hudak, and support the transit plan passed by the Toronto Council and get on with the job. Question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I know the Minister of Transportation will want to speak to the supplementary, Mr. Speaker, but just let me reiterate what I said yesterday, which is I am very pleased that our government has been investing in transit since we came into office. I'm very pleased that we have put $16.4 billion into transit, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased that there are lines being built at this moment, Mr. Speaker, across the GTHA. And I'm very pleased that our $1.4 billion for the Scarborough line, Mr. Speaker, has leveraged the engagement of the federal government, oh, Mr. Sorry. Speaker. Now it's up to the city to decide what it is going to do, Mr. Speaker. But our $1.4 billion stays on the table. We will build Subway in Scarborough, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very pleased that the opposition has come to the party, Mr. Speaker, this late in the game. Premier, the score is still 64 to nothing. Nothing! And I'm I'm asking now for the third time, will you please tell me when you plan to open a subway station? Now, maybe you can't tell me the exact day or month, but could you please at least tell us the year? Thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker, it, it's, it's interesting that it took six months and yesterday we had a first discussion between a federal and a provincial transportation minister in Ottawa, which went very well. So I think now, having six months of being nice got us nothing. Turning up the heat got us more press releases and more time with federal ministers. And I said that from now on, we should be able to keep that conversation chilled so that we can actually get work done, which is finally happening after six months, Mr. Speaker. The second thing, Mr. Speaker, we are building more subway stations digging more tunnels than at any time in the modern history of Ontario. We will shortly, within the next few years, have a better record than the party opposite. The problem, Mr. Speaker, is almost all the members over there weren't part of that era of subway building. They were, they were famous for the era, the era of subway closing, cancellation, and going in. And Mr. Speaker, we can measure now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Minister of Energy. Today, Ontario's Environmental Commissioner stated that when it comes to energy conservation, quote, there's not been much provincial policy activity to talk about. One glaring government failure on energy conservation is its commitment of hundreds of millions of dollars to refurbish the Darlington nuclear power plant. Before it's even considered the energy conservation alternatives. Why is the government putting expensive nuclear power expansion before cheaper energy efficiency? Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, the uh, critic from the third party will know uh, that we have issued a, uh, a conservation works. paper as part of the long-term energy plan review called Conservation First. And Mr. Speaker, uh, it is going to revolutionize con uh, conservation in the province of Ontario. There will be a policy in place uh, when it's adopted which says if it can be done cheaper by conservation, then that will happen before we do generation. It's responsible. It's but revolutionary, and it's going to make a significant difference. And coincidentally, Mr. Speaker, we have done some significant conservation already Three under the old policy works. from the 2010 plan, and that is 1,900 megawatts we've conserved since 2006. That's like taking 600,000 homes Answer. off the grid, Mr. Speaker. Well, thank, thank you. you. What about the power it's an interesting answer. Today, the Environmental Commissioner was clear that it's cheaper to conserve energy than to build new power plants. The government knows this. The minister knows this. In the summer, it released a discussion paper he mentioned entitled Conservation First. But even as it consults on this paper, it's allowing Ontario Power Generation to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on nuclear expansion projects. Why is the government 
undermining its conservation first policy by proceeding with this nuclear refurbishment. Mr. Speaker, this government supports nuclear energy. What about the power? The opposition party supports nuclear energy. Today, it's over 53 percent of the generation is from nuclear. It has served this province well. It's going to continue to serve us well in the future. Mr. Speaker, we have willing hosts in this community for nuclear power. It's, it's a tremendous boost to the economy. Mr. Speaker, nuclear energy is clean, it's renewable, it's cheap, it does the job. And Mr. above all, Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned yesterday, nuclear energy is extremely safe. We have the best safest power plants in the world, and we're going to continue to use them. Thank you. Here, here. Question, the member from York Southwestern. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. For most Ontarians, their homes are their sanctuary, providing a sense of comfort and security. But for women who are victims of domestic violence, their homes can be a prison that they are often afraid to leave. And when they make a decision about whether they should take their children and leave this often dangerous and potentially life-threatening situation, the decision becomes even more difficult, especially when they have no place to go and no one to turn to. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, I and I'm sure this whole House would like to know what the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing has done to help out these women and families in their time. Question. Of thank you. <laughs> Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I thank the member for asking this important question. Our government believes in providing safe and affordable housing for all those in need. And yesterday afternoon, we actually had a chance to put that uh, belief into practice uh, in a practical way when the Premier and the Minister responsible for women's issues and uh, the member from Etobicoke Centre, I know she was there at 6.30 in the morning, uh, building a, a house for Habitat for Humanity. And uh, we were there to participate with many members in the House on Good. Women Build Day great, great. to provide housing for six families with access to affordable housing and housing that they will uh, own. And uh, we believe that having a place to call home is the first step in realizing new opportunities and it's the first step to a better quality of life. Our special uh, priority policy requires service managers to Answer. place victims of domestic violence into safe, affordable housing as quickly as possible, to potentially saving the lives of those vulnerable women. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to thank the minister for that answer. Habitat for Humanity built some homes for new Canadians in my riding of York Southwest, and a few years ago I participated in that build, and it was a great experience. Uh, our government's protection of vulnerable women and families is very important, and I'm sure the minister will agree that all Ontarians need safe and affordable housing. When a senior, a young adult, or a family is unsure of where they will go to spend the night, they are more likely to fall through the cracks and not receive the services that they need. I understand that earlier this year, the federal government has announced that they would continue their cost-sharing agreement with our government for another four years. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, could she explain what work has been done with the federal government to ensure Question. that all levels of government continue to work together and invest in Ontario's most needy? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, uh, Speaker. And, uh, I, I am very grateful for the member for asking this question because I believe we have a shared obligation, a moral imperative as legislatures to stay at the table and to work to deliver affordable housing to Ontarians in need. Because that real the reality is that a healthy housing market serves all Ontarians and makes our province stronger. And our government has been working with our federal partners to begin the Invest in Affordable Housing program, which is a 50-50 cost-sharing agreement that will guarantee over $480 million of new funding over four years. And though our government welcomes the recent announcement of the federal government to extend its commitment to affordable housing, the fact remains that the federal government's contribution to social housing will evaporate unless they continue and decide to return to the table. I continue to Answer. ask and urge parties opposite to stand with our government to ask the federal government to commit to stable and predictable funding for all our housing providers over the long term. Thank you. Thank you. Question, the member from Burlington. <laughs> 
Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister, in January, we learned that hundreds of key recommendations to prevent the deaths of children in custody were ignored by government agencies. Now we are left wondering if children continue to be in danger because ministry-approved policies and procedures are not being followed. On May 27 and August 16 of this year, as part of a three-year performance review, your ministry issued 12 directives to Ch Ch Chatham-Kent Children's Services. Among them, all CKCS child protection workers were ordered to review the province's child protection standards, and all CKCS supervisors were ordered to receive clinical supervision training for an approved trainer within 90 days. That was May 27, 120 days ago. How many of those employees have completed their training? Good question. Mr. Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Speaker. And, uh, with respect to the uh, CAS accountability and uh, CAS directives that have been issued, our ministry is working very closely with that particular CAS and have, and have been working closely with that staff and with that director to ensure that our mandate, our objective of ensuring that all children are kept safe is maintained, and that is our goal and is what we will continue to do across the province with all our CASs. Two supplementary. So, Ministry, I'm not sure why you put a 90-day deadline and it's now 120, but anyway, uh, you have said that young people in the child welfare system are your priority. Your government talks about the right care at the right place at the right time, but you've given the public reason to question these claims. I have to ask, isn't it better to, change, to train child welfare employees before a crisis occurs rather than after? Good question. Thank you, Minister. Thank you again. And, and further to that, uh, Speaker, again, we are continuing to work with that particular ministry, of course, uh, that particular CAS. Of course, our staff are trained when they're out at that, uh, out, out at our agencies, working with our children across the Section province. We will act on anything that comes forward, and we did act in that situation in terms of doing a review and uh, determining what recommendations and directives needed to come forward. And we will continue to do that again for our communities and our neighborhoods and our families to ensure our children are kept safe. And that is absolutely our goal at that CAS and at CASs across the province. Thank you. Question the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is for the Premier. I think the Premier would agree that uh, nobody wants to be in the hospital, and when we're sick, our ability to eat fresh, healthy, and carefully prepared food in the hospital can do wonders for patient morale and for recovery. The patients at Scarborough Hospital have been benefiting from an innovative and much lauded program that brings fresh Ontario food into hospital rooms. All that's about to go out the window with the forced uh, uh, merger of Scarborough Hospital and the Rouge Valley Health System. Does the Premier believe that this innovative program deserves to become another budgetary casualty? Minister of Health, uh, Premier. Um, Mr. Speaker, I know that the uh, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care is going to want to comment in the supplementary on this particular issue, but I want to make a general comment wearing my uh, Minister of Agriculture and Food hat, Mr. Speaker, because I think that the Local Food Act is the framework within which we want to promote exactly what the leader of the third party is talking about, Mr. Speaker, so that public institutions, um, wherever they are, would be looking to local Ontario food for that, that fresh nutrition that we know uh, is so good for people, Mr. Speaker. So I don't know the specifics of this particular contract situation, but what I do know is that the Local Food Act is, is the mechanism whereby we want to promote exactly what the leader of the third party is talking about. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, once again, the Premier is good at conversations and talking, but not very good at actually getting things achieved. This government brags about transforming health care and bringing local food to Ontarians. But instead of supporting Scarborough Hospital for transforming patient menus with healthy meals made with ingredients grown in our own backyards, the health minister is working at cross purposes, Speaker. She's sitting on her hands and letting the Central East Again. Lynn Again. focus on damage control rather than on patient care. Now, this is actually a chance for the Premier to walk the walk, Speaker, and not just talk the talk. Will the Premier stop the plug from being pulled on this valuable local food based nutrition program? Question. Thank you. Premier. So, 
Mr. Speaker, my, my understanding is that there is no final merger at this no, point. That it's a discussion that's happening. So, so we need to let that roll out. And, uh, and you know, one of the reasons that um, that the the transformations that are happening within the structure of Linz is working is because they are local decisions. And so we need to let that happen, Mr. Speaker. But <laughs> what I what I want to reinforce, Mr. Speaker, is that the local food bill will support and promote exactly the kind of initiative that the leader of the third party is talking about. I made an announcement a few days ago about the $30 million local food fund, Mr. Speaker, that is going to allow is going to allow institutions and businesses and groups to promote local food and find ways of making sure that people get more local food on their plates. So, Mr. Speaker, we are completely supportive of what the leader of the third party is talking about. We want local food to be available in institutions and uh, if the bill is passed, yes, Mr. Speaker, which I hope it will be, then we will be able to operate within that framework and promote great Ontario local food. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. The member from Scarborough, Gilwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. During the summer in our Scarborough community, my colleague, the member of Scarborough Southwest, and I were visited by the minister where he toured the West Scarborough Neighbourhood Community Centre, a community organization providing valuable community services to children, youth, families and seniors. We had a wonderful time playing basketball with some young people that day. Our government understands the importance of healthy, active lifestyle and thus strive to integrate physical activity, recreation and sport in our lives and in the lives of our children. We also understand the importance in providing opportunities to allow people to engage in community, sport, recreation and physical activity. Speaker, through you to, the, to the Minister, can he please explain what our government is doing to ensure that all Ontarians have access to sport Thank and you. recreation opportunities? Thank you, thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Scarborough Gilbert for the question. Yes, I, I did uh, go to uh, West Scarborough for that basketball game with the kids. Unfortunately, I did not score one basket. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'm delighted to share that our government has made it a priority to increase opportunities for participation in sport and recreation activities for people of all ages and all abilities. Here, here. This is why in January 2013, my ministry launched the Ontario Sport and Recreation Communities Fund program in order to encourage lifelong physical activity as a result, enhance community engagement. Speaker, the funding allocation for this year's program is over $7 million. The fund is a short-term co-sharing program available for projects to address community and promote physical activity. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for that response. It is always great to hear about how our government is improving the quality of life and creating better opportunities for Ontarians. Building a foundation of lifelong physical activity for healthier lifestyle is important to our government. This fund will definitely be beneficial to the provincial organizations that apply for the funding. However, the local sport and recreation organizations are, are important as well. The people in my community of Scarborough Guildwood want to know what this funding program will do for them. Speaker, through you to the minister, what is the Ontario government doing to ensure that small, local organizations have access to this fund? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, thank you, uh, Speaker, again for the for the question, Speaker. I'm pleased to say that this fund, the Ontario Sport and Recreation Committee Fund, supports over 130 provincial, regional, and local projects all across the province including group walks for seniors, aquatic, fitness and skating, just to name How a few. Local service sports and municipalities can also apply for funding to support local projects over a period of one or two years. This fund addresses small local organizations and, in fact, speaker, the West Scarborough Neighborhood Community Centre 
will receive support through the Ontario Sport and Recreation Communities Fund program. Speaker, supporting local community programs that are accessible to everyone and assist people in staying active is part of Ontario government's efforts to help families lead healthy lifestyles. Thank, Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. New person. Thank you uh, very much, Hi. Speaker. My question uh, this morning is to the Premier. As you know, your government has managed to pass just one piece of legislation since February. Last week, you met with our leader, Tim Hudak. all of us to uh, come to order and uh, allow the question to be put. And also, uh, the member from Leeds Grenville is speaking while I'm speaking. And uh, I would ask that the question be put without uh, interruption and the answer be put without interruption. Please. Hey, Premier, last week you met with our leader to seek support in passing nine of your hand-picked bills. One bill that was not included was Bill 69, the Prompt Payment Act, a bill that has broad support from all three parties in this House because it is vitally important for Ontario's small and medium-sized construction firms. The Prompt Payment Act is also supported by stakeholders such as the Council of Ontario Construction Association and the Ontario Road Builders Association. Premier, if you do the work, you should get paid. Do you believe this, or is there some other reason why you didn't include Bill 69 question. on your personal wish list? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I believe that the uh, the piece of legislation that the member opposite is talking about is the member of Vervon bill. Member for Vaughan. Let me just say this, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased that the, that the PC, the, the uh, opposition, has agreed that there are some uh, pieces of legislation where there is enough common agreement that we can move ahead and uh, we can move those to the legislature. You know, Mr. Speaker, the reason that I asked for the meeting with the leader of the opposition and the leader of the third party was just that, was to say, I think there are some pieces of legislation where we've got all party agreement or we've got enough agreement that we can move them ahead. I'm very pleased that the opposition has yes, agreed sir. to that, that they we're going to be working together, the House leaders are working together, and I'm pleased that the legislature is working as it should Thank in the minority you. parliament, Mr. Speaker. I, uh, I was just going to recognize the member for supplementary, but there were people on his own side that were preventing me from understanding that you would hear me when I said supplementary. And as soon as the answer gets started, we hear the same thing. So I'm asking the member to put his supplementary question without interruption, and I'm asking for his an the answer to be heard without interruption. Please. Okay, well, thank you, Speaker and Premier. That kind of answer simply won't cut it. The construction industry employs over 400,000 men and women, approximately 6.5% of Ontario's total workforce. Many of these people are in small and medium-sized firms. Prompt payment legislation already exists in the majority of U.S. states, in the U.K., in Ireland, the EU, Australia and New Zealand. Premier, over 50% of your caucus was handpicked by you to join your ever-expanding cabinet, and I'm willing to bet your cabinet colleagues always receive their payment promptly and on time. With all three parties supporting prompt payment legislation, is it because the MPP from Vaughan is not one of your cabinet insiders that you haven't bothered to move forward with his Bill 69, Question. or do you simply not believe in the principles of prompt payment? I agree with you. Be seated, please. The, uh, the, uh, as much as it might be uh, fun and frivolous and filled with jocularity, it's still an interruption to the House. And I also want to remind the member from Renfrew, Pem Pembro Nipissing Pembroke, that you can actually make a disruption in the House without even saying anything. <laughs> 
seconds, and I don't want to have to dig up the video. So, you, you know what I'm talking about. Peter. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So the list of uh, the list of, of bills that um, that the leader of the opposition and I talked about, and that the leader of uh, leader of the third party and I talked about, were some some initial bills that I thought there was enough common ground on that we could uh, we could get some movement, Mr. Speaker. But there are lots of other pieces of legislation where I think that uh, that we can work together. Obviously, the uh, the member opposite has identified another piece of legislation. I'm sure the member for Vaughan is very happy to have the support, and so I think there are obviously more areas of common interest. So I look forward to getting the pieces that we've uh, that we've identified and then moving on to other pieces of legislation in fact we're suggesting a couple of other pieces Answer. the uh, employer health tax exemption and the waste reduction act those are areas where I think we can find agreement as well mr. speaker there's lots of work to be done look Thank forward you. to working with the opposition yeah, yeah. on it Your question the member from it's gone blank Kenora, Kenora Rainy River. Thank you, Speaker. To the Minister of Natural Resources. Minister, yesterday the Ontario government unveiled a fall colours campaign encouraging people to travel Ontario. But in my riding alone, seven parks have already closed for the season, and that does not include the northern parks that were permanently shut down by this government last year without any notice or consultation. And what's worse is that all 10 of the suggested routes in your tourism guide are in southern Ontario. And the guide also encourages people to stop in at their travel information centres, although this government has already shut those down, too. Minister, did you even consider Northerners when this fall colours campaign was even put together? Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, as a Northerner, uh, certainly we consider the priorities and interests of Northerners on this side of the House. With respect to the uh, parks, uh, Speaker, it's very, very clear that our commitment to managing the 334 parks in the province of Ontario is an incredibly important priority to our government. The member opposite is well aware that in last year's budget, with respect to the fiscal challenges that we're facing in the ministry and the transformation efforts that were being made, a number of parks uh, were converted to non-operational status. It didn't mean they were closed. It meant that there would not be staff present and individuals could still explore those parks and have that opportunity. In recent uh, in the recent year, uh, Speaker, we've been able to develop partnerships with four communities to reopen and create the operational status again at four of those parks, which we are uh, certainly very pleased with. There are ongoing efforts yes, to continue to work with communities to reopen parks or to create the operational status designation, and I look forward to working with the Thank member. You, Thank you. Minister, last Earlier this year, the MNR closed seven parks across the north permanently. And I agree that northern parks are beautiful and that they should be enjoyed, but this government has locked the gates. It shut down travel information centres across the northwest and replaced them with an app that doesn't have our content and doesn't work in the north. We have travel Manitoba signs dotting our highways, and now it unveils its tourism strategy in black and white. Travel Southern Ontario. Minister, what? Is this what your government means when it tells us, trust us, we have a solid tourism strategy for Northern Ontario? Speaker, I, uh, I hear the bluster from the member opposite. The reality is that the government is committed to ensuring that we provide positive experiences and opportunities for everyone across this province, whether it's in Northern Ontario or Southern Ontario. As the member is well aware, there was a decision that was made last year with respect to the operational status of our provincial parks. And I'm very pleased with the partnerships that we have been able to deliver on. The parks in the uh, province operate at 82 per cent cost recovery. We are still not recovering the level of funds that go into the investment that we make in Ontario parks. We're continuing to make our parks more accessible with our online registration for camping and other opportunities in our parks. We're continuing to look for new ways to, in, to uh, support our parks and programs like Learn to Camp in Ontario Parks and Learn to Fish. 
So, Speaker, uh, I certainly I hear the member opposite's concerns. We are concerned around these issues as well, and ensuring that Ontarians have a thank great you. experience in our parks. Question. The member from Thunder Bay, Atacokan. Speaker, thank you very much. My question is for the Minister of uh, Natural Resources. Minister, I'm aware that your ministry announced in July of this year that you were rebuilding the fire attack base in Armstrong, north of Thunder Bay, a major capital investment from your ministry wow. into northern Ontario. Armstrong is a small community, and I'm pleased that this investment it was made by your ministry and by our government. Not only will this investment, and it's interesting that we have this question now just following on the heels of the last question, not only will this investment from your ministry be an essential safety measure in enhancing northwestern Ontario's firefighting capabilities, it will also secure local jobs in the community. Jobs. Speaker, could the Minister of Natural Resources please, ex please explain for the members of the House how this major investment from this ministry in northern Ontario to the forest fighter base will improve firefighting capabilities in our region? Thank you. Minister thank you, uh, Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Thunder Bay out of for this important question, and he's certainly correct. We made a very significant capital investment in three fire bases across the province one of which is in uh, the members' area. Armstrong is in dire need of being upgraded as a number of their buildings are more than 50 years old. These buildings will be demolished and new ones will be built. The upgrade in Armstrong is uh, one of three important investments that the ministry is making. Specifically, we're investing $47 million into enhancing firefighting capabilities in three communities. We're also investing in Sudbury at the uh, airport. The facility is in need of upgrade there as well. And in Halliburton at the uh, Halliburton Stanhope Municipal Airport. At the center of it, Speaker, these investments are not only about bricks and mortar, but about investing in people and ensuring that these courageous men and women have the resources and tools they need to do this important and dangerous job. Thank you. I uh, want to quickly advise the House that the motion passed on June 5, 2013, with respect to the legislation establishing the Financial Accountability Officer, Bill 95, has an anomaly with respect to the timing of the Legislative Assembly Committee to report the bill after it completes clause-by-clause -clause consideration. In the absence of any other instruction from the House to do otherwise, it will make sense for the committee simply to follow what would normally happen in any committee on any bill. That is, that the committee report the bill at the first available opportunity following completion of clause by clause. Therefore, the committee will report the bill tomorrow afternoon during routine proceedings if it has finished clause by clause consideration at that time. If not, the bill will instead be reported on Thursday afternoon during routine proceedings. The timing is relevant because the reporting of the bill triggers an immediate two-hour debate on third reading of the bill. I hope that's clear. We have a deferred vote on the motion for third reading of Bill 14, an act to amend the Cooperative Corporations Act and Residential Tenancies Act 2006 in respect to nonprofit housing cooperatives and to make consequential amendments to other acts. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bell.
Yes, would the members take their seats, please? <laughs> members take their seats, please. Thank you. On September the 23rd, Mr. Nackley moved third reading of Bill 12. You're, you're overpowering me, and you don't even have a mic. On September the 23rd, Mr. Nackley moved third reading of Bill 14. All those in favor, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mrs. Jeffers. Mrs. Jeffers. Mr. Malloy. Mr. Malloy. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Garretson. Mr. Garretson. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Madame Mayer. Madame Mayer. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bartonetti. Mr. Bartonetti. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mrs. Cansfield. Mrs. Cansfield. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Peruzza. Mr. Peruzza. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Mora. Mr. Mora. Mr. McNeely. Mr. McNeely. Mr. Padre. Mr. Padre. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Balkasson. Mr. Balkasson. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Pratt. Mr. Pratt. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mrs. Elliott. Mrs. Elliott. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Holliday. Mr. Holliday. Ms. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Chudley. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. Willett. Mr. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mrs. McKenna. Mrs. McKenna. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Leone. Mr. Leone. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Milligan. Mr. Milligan. Mr. Claren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Ms. Should be Song. Should be Song. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. DeNovo. Ms. DeNovo. Mr. Marchese. Mr. Marchese. Mr. Prue. Mr. Prue. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natishka. Mr. Natishka. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Shine. Mr. Shine. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Who's going to start the kumbaya and be entitled as in the motion. The member from Kitchener-Conestoga on a point of order. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I just want to remind uh, members of the Blackberry Experience reception today at 5.30 in room 2.30. I encourage you to sign up online and uh, attend uh, later this afternoon. Thank you, Speaker. That's, um, that's not a point of order, but I wish to see everybody there. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke on a point Mr. of order. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. Uh, earlier today, uh, during question period, and I want to make it very clear, uh, Mr. Speaker, I would never be challenging a ruling of the Speaker, but I do ask for your consideration of a clarification on this point. In, during question period, I, I, re I um, recognized the government 
as mentioning, which we have had previously in this House as a standard practice, saying the McGuinty government, the Harris government, the Mike Harris government, the Bill Davis government, the Dalton McGuinty government. I only in questioning said under a Kathleen Wynne government, and you ruled that I could not use the member's name. I was not referring to the member's name in any particular way other than to identify the government, and it has been the practice of this House to allow that. Otherwise, uh, we are going to have a very difficult time in debates going forward, even being able to recognize governments of the past or to, to, be, to be able to designate them as being the ones responsible or uh, for any particular action. I, uh, I do accept the member's uh, premise that it is clarification and that it does not challenge the, uh, the speaker. I accept that. Um, I am also going to um, endeavour to seek counsel from the table. Um, I am concerned, and I want to use this as a moment, a quick moment, to explain to the member. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit on a crusade uh, to have us all refer to members' titles and to their writings. Um, I will take your, uh, your point of order in consideration, and I believe we may be able to come to an agreement on how that's going to proceed, but I want to use this as a moment to reflect on what we have been doing, and maybe we can probably put some of that to rest, but I do accept what the member is saying as uh, uh, clarification. I will seek counsel, report back to the member uh, sharply, but I do caution him that I'm looking for changes of how we're doing things, and it might even include that, but I don't want to make that prejudgment until I seek counsel from the table. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, there are no further votes. This uh, House stands adjourned until 3 p.m. this afternoon, and a reminder of the members of female persuasion to meet us at the front door.